You know, when I was a new Christian, Colossians was my book. I, so many, when I, I, you guys probably know that, but when you're a new Christian, you look at the Bible and you're just like, oh my goodness, I don't know what to do with this stuff. But I'd get Colossians and I always feel like, oh, I would, I would read it. And I think I liked it because it was short and I could feel like, hey, I, got, I read the whole thing. And, uh, and it was so practical. But I think that as I thought about it, I just remember mostly the way I felt. I felt grateful for what God had done, and I also felt an excitement for what was coming. Uh, you know, and I think when Paul would write the Colossians, the way he, especially in this first chapter, the way he addresses them, you can tell he actually just has this love for them and excitement for what's going on inside of them, and he's affirming them, and, and I think it's God's heart. And so when I read it, I would feel like, oh, God's affirming me, and, and God's helping me in this way. And so what... As we, as we go through this, I, 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 thought, I thought of this, I thought, it's, it, the feeling was like this, is, uh, you know, being a father and a grandfather, when you have your kids growing up in the right direction, you know, when they're, when they're doing things that you can tell, this is good, this is going the right place, you know, that feeling how good that is, even if you, you can think about anything, but even when you're just first walking, right? This kind of strange scene where this kid's balancing and everybody's around and they're like cheering him on and this kid's balancing and eventually that kid takes a step, right? Now, in that kid's mind, he, he's happy as can be because now he can get to mess up your coffee table and destroy things and get around and explore things. But the, the, the parents are even more happy because they're thinking, it's going the right direction. I see this happening in my child and what we're thinking is much bigger than that. We're saying... This thing about walking is much bigger than this child understands. What's, what they've just moved into is going to take them to what? Crawling, in, no, standing and climbing and, and jumping and dancing and running, right? And so when I, Colossians, that's kind of the way it is. He, he sees the, the, the Colossians and says, and Paul just says, I see these things in you. And he's just excited because there's this new thing coming. Now, the book of Colossians uh, was written probably in about 60, 62 A.D. Paul was in his mid-50s. He'd, know, he'd been walking with Jesus probably since his 30s. So he's had lots of experience, but he's in prison. And uh, he's in Rome. And knowing that God doesn't make mistakes, so he's there and he has time. And he just happens to write by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, Philippians, Ephesians, Colossians, and uh, Philemon. So... You know, got all those books in this one prison stay. And we're going to be covering Colossians. Now, Paul was in Rome, which is quite a long ways away, <laughs> a thousand miles about, from where uh, Colossae is. And the, the church uh, was somebody that didn't know Paul. Now, Paul's in prison. Now, when he's in prison, he's probably... Uh, now, he's been in lots of prisons. Paul's a pro, and he, and he can rate them, right? You know, he can Yelp rate them. The, you know, when he was in, uh, in, in one prison early on, Philippi, that was bad, one rating, horrible prison. But then he moved up, Caesarea, get a little better. This was not a four-star prison, but it is a prison, but it was a little bit better. He's a Roman citizen. And now in there, as you're a prisoner, you don't... He was probably was possibly chained to another guard, uh, uh, probably an elite guard, or, but he was always under watch 24-7. But in the prison there, you would actually take care, you would be responsible. The people who knew Paul were responsible. He had, because he was a Roman citizen, he, had a, a meal, he could have meals if he wanted to, but they usually brought in their meals and all the things they need, and there were people who could actually visit with him. And so, but he, he had never met the people he's writing this letter to. It wasn't one of the churches he planted. He, he actually was right there, next to him with the, and connected to Laodicea, which is close to him, but he, he didn't, Colossae, he didn't go through. It was kind of on, out of the beaten path. And so as you think about that, uh, probably uh, uh, F of Russ, F, I've pronounced this four times this morning because I, you listen to those pronouncing words and I got three, two of them that were different. So now I'm totally confused, but uh, Epirusa, Epir, <laughs> how do you pronounce that? Huh? Epaphus. Yeah, okay, we'll try that one. That was one of them, the other one is Epaphus. 
Actually, probably Epaphras was actually the person who planted the, the church, and he was their pastor, and so he knew Paul. He was, he, uh, he was connecting, and he went up and talked to Paul, connected to him, and Paul's like, you got to see what's happening in the church, and he's telling all these stories. And so if you can imagine what this felt like, you know, this, and, and, the, and the excitement was of all that God was doing, but the problem was, too, is they were in... Uh, Colossae was actually in a place that was primarily Gentiles, there was some, but there's also some Jews there as well, and they had threats on both sides because the Jews were saying, you need to go back to Judaism and trying to make them do customs, and that was a threat. And then the other side of the threat was the, the culture. The prominent culture was, you know, many gods and idols, and, and this is an agent minor. I mean, Paul radically changed when he began doing his missionary uh, trips to the point that there were people who were making money off idols so much they were upset because Paul was saying things that are made by hand are not God. And they were upset about it, right? So this had a huge impact. So they know about Paul, but they've never met him personally. But Paul now knows about them. And if you notice that there's a lot of a temptation, especially by the prominent culture, is just to blend God into their cultural view and their, the way they looked at their uh, Gnosticism and, and blend them in or make them just one of the many gods. And so if you notice in Colossians, you will see the word all a lot. So as you go to that manuscript, watch for that word all and see how many times it's written because it's about Jesus being all of everything, the creator, God. And so you'll see that word all quite often. Now, so they, they get this letter. And imagine one of uh, Paul's friends probably carried it to them. And if you can imagine hearing, and here they are, Gentiles. They don't really even know the Torah. And the, the Old Testament's people who are twisting the truth on what the gospel is. And they're, they've experienced Jesus. They've listened to messages. They've believed in Jesus. They're experienced. They're praying, connecting, worshiping. And then, but you can imagine how hard that was. But now there's a letter coming from Paul out of prison. You can imagine what that felt like. So we're going to be opening up with this 12 verses, these 300 words, uh, and talk about the gospel. Um, and so, and it's really relevant. I mean, it's, it's, it's relevant at, you know, it's, 61 AD is to 2021. It's, it's so relevant to where we're at in our culture right now. So, let's go through this together. And there we go. Okay. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God. And Timothy, Timothy was always helping him, one of his closest friends, staying with him a lot in Rome. And to the saints and faithful brothers in Christ at Colossae, grace to you and peace from God our Father. Now here he starts out, and he, he, he's an apostle. Apostle is just one sent forth a message. He's now... We know of the 13, the 12 disciples, and then Paul also was an apostle, but that there's a clear, distinct role that God gave. But we also see this ministry of people being sent with messages throughout church history, right? Even in John Wimber, you know, Paul even talks about that when he starts to explain the gifts in, in Corinthians 12. But, but even John Wimber, who was the founder of the vineyard, used to always be called an apostle, and he didn't like that because <laughs> it came with a lot of more stuff than, than he wanted. So he'd say, I'm not... I'm, I'm not I just wanted to be an epistle. That's what Paul John would say. <laughs> and he says, you know, and it would be a, so the small a apostle, we see that happening quite a bit. One sent with a message, and then he is addressing the saints. So it, right here, you just need to know this. If you didn't know this before, if you're in this room and you, you know Jesus, you are a saint. You need to put that on your bumper stickers. You need, you know, when someone says, you're a saint, you go, I know. So, because it's true. It's very biblical. And then he basically just starts with this great greeting of God's grace, his favor, his peace, his shalom on them. And then he dives in. He says, we always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, when we pray for you. Since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and the love that you have for all the saints. So Paul, he, he's heard this. He knows all the stories, and he says, I, I want to tell you, this is amazing. And he begins just affirming them for this. 
And he goes on to say, after he talks about these things that have been going on, the, the fruit that's been coming out of their life, he says, because of the hope laid up for you in heaven. Of this I have heard, you have heard before in the word of the truth, the gospel, which has come to you, as indeed in the whole word it is bearing fruit and increasing, as it also does among you. Since the day that we heard it, since you heard it and understood it, the grace of God and truth, just as you learned it from Tom? Epaphras. There you go. Just testing you on your knowledge because I, I know these things. I just want to check you out. All right. Uh, my beloved service, servant, he is a faithful minister of Christ on your behalf and has made known to us your love in the Spirit. So here he starts out with this word, affirms them and says, because this has happened, is, what's caused this faithfulness is, your, is the, this place of, of your hope laid up in heaven. And so as he goes through these things, he begins just affirming them in these things that they're, they're experiencing faithfulness, that it's coming through them, they have, they have faith in Jesus, they love all believers. I mean, that's pretty good. And he ends with this statement in verse 8, is that, and a better translation probably is the love you have from the Spirit, right? So we've watched the Spirit in you loving people. And at that point, you know, Paul is probably really excited for that. But what we see next is this place of, oh, there's so much more. He starts out and says this, and so from the day we heard, we have not ceased to pray for you, asking that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding, so that as to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing him, bearing fruit in every good work, and increasing in the knowledge of God, being strengthened with the power according to his glorious might, for all endurance and patience with joy, giving thanks to the Father who qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. You know, it's like he's saying, I'm so grateful for all that God has done through the gospel and all God is doing in you, but I'm telling you there's way more. And he just begins talking about and just praying for these things that God, he wants to see take place in their lives. Now, let's go back a little bit. The, the words that stood out to me in this that just, I, I just kept kind of focusing in on, the first word was because. Because he, Paul states these amazing things that are happening in them, that they have this love, <laughs> that they have this faithfulness, they have this trust and, they, and he goes in, he says, here's why you have it. Because of your hope laid up in heaven. And as you look at that, you say, well, how did I, how did I get this hope? And it tells you right after that. Which has come to you, which is this, of heaven, of, of this you have heard before in the word of truth, the gospel which has come to you. So they, the reason they can do this is because something has shifted and it's happened where it put a hope in heaven and it's tied directly to the gospel. Now, if you know and anything about Paul and you've read any of Paul's writings, you will hear the word gospel a lot. Over and over, you'll hear the word gospel. There are, in the New Testament, there are 92 times the word gospel is in there. 69 of 92 are Paul. Every letter he wrote, other than Titus, has the gospel, usually multiple times. So it's really no surprise in the very first opening few 300 words, he brings it up as his starting point as we go through it. These are, I won't give you all 69 references, but I'll give you a few. 
You know, I'm called the Apostle Paul, set apart for the gospel of God. I serve with my spirit in the gospel of his son. I am eager to preach the gospel. I am not ashamed of the gospel for the power of salvation to anyone who believes. It is my ambition to preach the gospel where Christ has not been preached. Now to him who is able to strengthen you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ, we endure anything rather than put an obstacle in the way of the gospel of Christ. I do all for the sake of what? The gospel. And then when he's correcting church, he says, why are you deserting him who called you in the grace of Christ and now turning to a different gospel? So what we see is this whole thing of the gospel. Now, if you've been around church a lot, this is a word that can just go, ching right over, you know, I've heard it a million times, you know, I have, I have my definition of the gospel, and, uh, or you just don't, you know, say, oh yeah, that means good news, but you don't really know what that means, right? But it, it's, it's a very simple phrase with a lot of depth. You know, before when I was a, a newer Christian, or been even for quite a while, I, someone asked you, do you understand the gospel? Yeah, I say, yeah, I understand, it's, it's really good news, right? And, and I grew up And this is the good news I understood about the gospel. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, but whoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. I heard that in my growing up all the time. And that is amazing news. I understood the gospel. The gospel is this message, the good news of Jesus, that he came and I was sinful and he is a holy God and I I was separated from my creator, God, and Jesus came and lived a perfect, sinless life, suffered and died, and resurrected. And as I now trust in that, that grace, I am forgiven. I am made right with God, and I have access to God. He's faithful and just to forgive me of all my sins. This is amazing. And when I physically die from this earth, I don't die. My life continues, and it's a better place. Not this world with all the sin and brokenness and suffering. It's a glorious place to live. This is like, oh, this is great. And so that was what I knew about the gospel. That's the gospel. And that's kind of where I stopped, you know, waiting to die when it got better, right? What I didn't understand is the gospel was much bigger than that. The gospel was something in which that was much larger than that. You know, it was this place in which that as I grasped this thing of the gospel, this thing shifted where now I had this different kind of, I, I, I was living and hoping for completely different things. And it was placed in this place above me, this place of heaven that we're talking about, this place that God has been talking to us about. And so I, I, I recognize, oh, this changes everything, you know. And so I understood that the gospel is actually what reveals your need. I understood that the gospel revealed who Jesus was, and as you said yes to him, you came in a relationship. I, I knew those things, but I really didn't understand how the gospel actually impacted you on earth while we're here, right? Other than be a good person before you go to heaven, right? And that was pretty boring life, right? What's so cool about the gospel is the gospel is better than you think it is. And you say, no, it's really good. No, it is better than you think it is. And tomorrow it will be even better. And the next day it will be even better. The more you understand the gospel, you realize the good news, then it's like, okay, I've got it. No, it, it actually keeps expanding. Now, in verse 12, I love what it says, where it says, he has qualified you to share in the inheritance. <laughs> That's good news. In other words, you have now been shifted, and now you are actually not just connected to Jesus, and you, you are actually a co-heir of Christ. You are actually have this place of inheritance, and you can begin experiencing that now, not after, just after you die. It changes the way you live now. And then we look in verse 5. I love that verse. It says, the gospel has come to you. And this, this is a fun one to think about. If you know Jesus, 
God figured a way of getting the gospel to you. It came to you. You know? And you can all, we can, have all, we can stay here all day and say, how did it come to you? And you say, this is how it came to me. Through this thing, through this thing, this, at that moment, this happened, right? Maybe you're here today and you're not sure if you really have received the gospel. You're not sure if you've trusted yourself in the gospel. Probably if you're here today, you know what I'm talking about. The gospel comes to you. Because usually, that's how God pursues us. It's a spot in which that we sense the truth of who Jesus is. And as we hear people talking in our hearts, we feel this thing happening. We're going, i got to decide if I believe this or not. You can feel this invitation. You know, I remember numbers of times when I, was, when I was, before I committed my life fully to Jesus, it's like, invitation, no thank you. Invitation, no thank you. But I, the whole time it was coming to me, right? And so, the gospel has come to the Colossians, and that's what the gospel does. It, God uses the gospel, and it goes out, and it just keeps, you can tell, here's an example. Paul, when he's talked about the gospel, he says, we want to clear out any hindrances, any, any obstacles for the gospel. It's like the gospel is going. <laughs> it's going out, and we're going to clear the obstacles so people can hear it and respond to it. The other thing about it is, is that here's what's kind of cool. Look in verse 7. You know, Tom, who did they get this gospel from? That's what I thought. There we go. When you're dyslexic, you have to have other tricky things you do to make it creative. All right. So how did they find out about it, right? They found out about it because he talked to them. He told the stories. He, he, he told them that this is who Jesus is. Here's the cool thing about the gospel. Now this is, this is sometimes people go, oh no, but this is amazing. This is the good news. You get to deliver it to people. You get, the gospel is delivered from those who received it. This is how it increases. You know, that's why we look at Jesus when he before he arises and ascends to heaven, he says, here's what your job is. Last words are kind of important. Just go out and be my witnesses. Just tell the story of who I am to everybody. That's why Paul, who understands the gospel and how it works, he says, oh yeah, how can they believe in him if they've never heard about him and how can they hear about him unless someone tells them and how will anybody tell them without being sent and why this is why the scripture says how beautiful are the feet of the messengers who bring good news but the final thing that I just love about the gospel is in verse 6 where it says that the gospel it just keeps increasing and bearing fruit not only bringing more people into this place, this amazing good news of coming into this relationship with Jesus, but within those people, the gospel starts transforming them. The more they understand the story of Jesus, the more their life changes. You know, I, I used to think I know the gospel, and now it's like, I know part of it. I, I, know, I know how people enter into the start, but that's just the start. And I know a lot more about other things, but I even understand that I, it's better than I can ever get a hold of. I love the way the message says that it says, uh, talking about this place of it bearing fruit, it says, the gospel, it doesn't diminish or weaken over time. It's the same all over the world. The message bears fruit gets larger and stronger just as it has in you. And from the very first day you heard and recognized the truth of what God is doing, you've been hungry for more. It is as vigorous as you, in you now as when you first learned it. And then he closes up the, the letter, I mean the, the section here, with talking and saying, 
when we heard about what the gospel started in you, we're so encouraged, but now we have not ceased to ask for these other things. We're so grateful this has happened, but we're now praying every time, every day, for you to have the gospel increase the knowledge of his will, spiritual wisdom, understanding, bearing fruit in every good work, increasing in knowing God, strengthening you by God's power, giving you endurance and patience and joy and being filled with gratitude. It's like, I love what's going on so far, but there's more that's going to happen as you grasp the good news of Jesus. So, invitation today. The horse team can come up. The invitation today is just moving yourself towards Jesus. We, we do this in and moving others towards Jesus um, for you. Now, first I want to say that anybody here who has not said yes to Jesus, who has heard the story of Jesus, may even a, a, a mentally ascend, yes, that probably happened, but they, they haven't trusted their life to the message of Jesus. You know, I just want to say, start that today. Say yes to that today. But most of us here have uh, experienced the gospel, and we're, we know that, that we see the fruit in our life. And I would just say, understand there's more. And so what I'd encourage you to do is ask God to help you grasp the gospel more fully and pray Paul's prayer in Colossians for yourself. You can pray it for the rest of us too, but pray it for yourself. Personalize it and begin praying that for you. And secondly, I would say this, is just moving others towards Jesus. Here's something so profoundly simple and so profoundly par powerful, and you'll automatically feel a bit of spiritual resistance when I say it, because it's that powerful. But it's very simple. Tell someone this week about the good news of Jesus and how Jesus has impacted your life. And the power of the gospel will do its work. You don't have to argue. You don't have to know everything, just tell people who Jesus is and how he's impacted your life. Tell them a story, all right? Why don't you stand? And I, just, I would like to just pray over this before we move into worship that in a simple way, Paul understands this. That's why he brings it up. It's what, if you look at Paul's life and say, how did, he, how did this all happen with him? It's because he understood the message of Jesus, deeper and deeper and deeper. And so, God, we pray for that for us. Lord, let us understand the message of Jesus as we take communion, help us to remember that, as we just think about you this week, as we go through the manuscript, manuscript study, I pray that you'll just continue to show us more about who you are, Jesus. And God, would you help us as a church to to be more bold in sharing our love for you to other people, for telling the good news to people with our personalities and the way we want to, but just getting it out there that we're no Jesus and here's what Jesus has done in my life. So God, we ask you for your grace in this. We pray that you will begin building these things that Paul prayed for for the Colossians in us. Holy Spirit, just come now.